Hello, everyone. My name is Liz Wishnick. I'm a senior research scholar at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. I'm also a senior research scientist at CNA um, on leave from Montclair State University. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to, to this panel to discuss Russia in the Indo-Pacific. Um, this is a launch of our book. I just received my copy today. We're, we're all very excited about it. So you have here with you today four scholars from a multinational team uh, who have been collaborating for many years, some of us uh, for many decades, uh, to explore regionalism in Northeast Asia and Russia's role in it. And we owe a great debt, debt of gratitude to Gaia Christofferson, the editor of this volume, who was one of the pioneers in this field and played a, 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 an enormously important role in uh, situating Russia in the study of Asia. And another one of our contributors, uh, Suneo Akaha, uh, also played a, a tremendous role in this effort. Unfortunately, he passed away in November of last year. Um, I think this panel today, which is a difficult day for the study of international relations, uh, shows the enduring nature of scholarly exchange, despite all the downs and ups of relations. Um, here we are, uh, a multinational team uh, trying to um, engage on scho in scholarly discussion and hopefully to achieve some mutual understanding. And this panel is also a testament to the Fulbright program because both Gaia and I had two Fulbrights each, uh, one each in Russia and in China, and some of the relationships that um, are apparent in the in the scholarly research in this book are a product of of those exchanges. Um, so. Russia is on everyone's mind today in terms of European politics, um, but uh, despite the fact that 75% of its territory is located in Asia, um, it's interesting to note that it's not mentioned at all in the US Indo-Pacific strategy that was just released uh, this past month. Um, and uh, uh, the part of Russia uh, where Artyom Lukin, Professor Artyom Lukin um, is from uh, the Russian Far East is two thirds the size of the United States and has many important resources. And so we neglect uh, Russia's role in Asia at our peril. Um, and so this volume, it looks at Russia's role in the Indo-Pacific from uh, different perspectives. So I'm going to introduce the panelists and uh, each panelist will tell you more about uh, her or his uh, contribution and our first panelist, uh, Gaia Christofferson, the editor of the volume, uh, former professor of international politics, Johns Hopkins University in the Saiz Nanjing Center, now in California. So Professor Christofferson will tell us a bit more about the volume and her own research. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Elizabeth Wishnick and the Weatherhead Institute for hosting our book launch today. Um, I'm really delighted uh, to be able to be here to be able to talk about it. I wanted to talk about the origins of our book. It goes back to the first time we had a panel at ISA, uh, and some of the people here were on that panel, and it was 2012, so that was 10 years ago, although I've known some of you for 30 years, if you can think that's possible. Yes, I have. Um, and the, the title of that panel was Contending Visions and Interpretations of Russia's Role and Identity in the Asia Pacific. So right from the beginning, we accepted different perspectives. We didn't have any anticipation that we would all look at the topic in the same way. And it was that first panel, and it was in San Diego, I believe, where I started suggesting that we turn our work into a book, but we went through many panels at ISA from 2013 to 2018, but didn't come up with a joint publication until much later. So everyone was asked to have um, 
innovative approaches to talking about Russian foreign policy. Um, I felt that there was some need for that in the study of Russian foreign relations because so often Russian officials and scholars uh, rely primarily on the discourse of realist balance of power and geopolitical struggle. And sometimes they talk about a concert of powers, uh, which is their idea of multilateralism uh, governing the East Asian order. And to me, it sounds very 19th century or early 20th century, but not the 21st century. Um, Russia, generally speaking, has minimal discourse power in the East Asian region. Um, there have been, for example, there have been repeated Russian efforts to design an Asia Pacific security architecture. And we can think about, well, Brezhnev tried to do that, Gorbachev tried to do that. And most recently, Putin has the Greater Eurasian Partnership. But these ideas by uh, Russian leaders have not been really adopted by Asia. So I saw the problem that Russian, Asian, and Western scholars have not yet achieved a common discourse within a global epistemic community. Uh, that there are many conceptual gaps. And so hoping to maybe connect some of those discourses or understandings, uh, we did a special issue in Asian perspective with a, a smaller initial group where every author was asked to present um, a different innovative theoretical approach to explaining Russian Asian relations. And then we uh, ultimately expanded into a much larger group for the book, Russia in the Indo-Pacific. Um, this reflects in some ways a growing internationalization in Russian studies of international relations. Although I think it's um, just at its initial stages. Uh, I think this trend then could facilitate Russian contributions to an emerging global IR theory which would uh, create the possibility of a more intelligible uh, common discourse in the Indo-Pacific among IR scholars, Russian, Chinese, Western. I don't think we're there yet, but that was uh, the intent of the book. Uh, my chapter, I draw on the English school to examine uh, Sino-Russian interactions over how to link uh, Russia's Eurasian Economic Union with China's Silk Road Economic Belt or the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, um, maintaining a regional order that constrains the rivalry for spheres of influence. So uh, the way I look at it is that it's an ongoing process of adaptation and accommodation. And sometimes they do hit a bump in the road and they manage to uh, adapt to it, to accommodate, which prevents any overt conflict. Um, I was gonna introduce two other chapters, but maybe I'll save that. Um, I was going to mention that one of the unique contributions of the book um, is that we have a Chinese author, Feng Yujun, who talks about the methodologies that Chinese scholars use in their study of Russia. And he takes a long view of the last 400 years and the lessons Chinese have learned when studying Russia. So we have a sense of a continual process of learning. I thought that was a rather unique chapter. And the other chapter uh, by Elisaveta Priopolina, uh, looks at how uh, the Russian approaches to the analysis of Sino-Russian relations and puts it within an emerging Russian school of IR. So I thought this was um, something that I had not seen in a lot of the literature, but I won't say anything else about any of the other chapters and I'll give somebody else a chance to talk. Thank you. Thank you, Gaia, for, for starting us off. Um, so next, we're going to turn to the study of Korean identity, which is a really fascinating 
aspect of the politics of the Russian Far East, which we don't typically think about. And we have uh, uh, Dr. Yelena Fedichkina Tracy, who is an associate researcher at the Virtual Research Lab and a Russian East European and Eurasian Center at the University of Illinois. And she is joining us from Canada. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. So the title of my presentation is Primordial Rights of Civic Values, What Constitutes a Korean Identity in the Russian Far East? I co-authored this chapter with Dr. Tamara Treyakova from the Far Eastern Federal University. Uh, Tamara has worked on this uh, topic for many years. Uh, she's a real empirical knowledge behind it. Uh, but she's now in a different time zone and unfortunately cannot join us um, tonight, but she's sending her best regards. Um, so the role of Russia in the Korean Peninsula, its politics and society broadly construed, is not well understood and has been neglected in IR literature. Meanwhile, Russia and the Soviet Union had uh, a major influence in the peninsula, politically, diplomatically, economically, and culturally. It was Soviet Union uh, that played the pivotal role in establishing the uh, Democratic People's Republic of Korea and in what followed after that. In addition to this, the Russian Far Eastern region, which is a large region, is home to a significant ethnic Korean population today. The Korean diaspora has been actively engaged in establishing linkages with both Koreas, prompting uh, what can be called as a track to diplomacy or people to people, business to business, not facilitated via official government channels. Um, the unification of the Korean Peninsula proposed by the government of South Korea, uh, by Moon Jae-in, to be achieved by the year of 2045, assumes a common Korean identity that can transcend ideological and political differences currently dividing the peninsula into the two states. This assumption evokes many theoretical and empirical questions about culture and ethnicity and their role in forming a political identity. So to analyze this very possibility for constructing such identity, we turn to the constructivism literature in political uh, science, IR, and in social anthropology uh, as conceptual lenses to view the establishment and history of the Korean diaspora residing in the Russian Far East in close proximity to the Korean Peninsula. Uh, so the relevance of this case study for the question of unification can be justified at least uh, on two grounds. Uh, first, the endurance of the Korean diaspora in Russia, preserving its distinct identity over several generations, despite the very traumatic historical context, is definitely a factor. And secondly, the Koreans, um, the Koreans currently living in Russia, or they call themselves as Korea Saram, uh, trace their family roots and links to the both Koreas. So to begin with, I would like to offer some historical background. Uh, first Korean settlers became registered in the territory of the Russian Empire when the Russian government gained control over the lands located in the south of the Amur River, and now it's uh, Primorsky and Khabarovsky provinces, after signing in 1858 the Treaty of Aigun with the Qin Dynasty of China. By the end of the 19th century, many Korean settlers were granted the right to, to register as citizens of the Russian Empire. They formed the largest ethnic group among border minorities. Many Korean settlers moved to Vladivostok, which was the largest city in Primorsky province, uh, which at the time was very multi-ethnic, uh, open to immigrants and to foreign investors coming from East and West. In 1910, the annexation of Korea by the Japanese empire prompted more Koreans to apply for Russian citizenship and protection. For several years, the struggle against Japanese intervention in Korea became the, an important consolidating factor for the Korean diaspora in Primorsky province. By the end of the Russian Civil War, in 1922, it's exactly 100 years from now um, ago, the establishment of Soviet administration in the far east of Russia, um, about 91,000 ethnic Koreans resided in the territory of Primorsky province. In the 1930s, the political context 
changed dramatically. The introduction of tough border control measures by Stalin government brought Korean immigration to a complete halt. In 1937, the entire population of the Korean diaspora was forcefully relocated to the Kazakh and Uzbek Soviet republics in Central Asia. It was part of Stalin's internal forced migration policy. After the end of the Second World War, Soviet forces took over the territories previously controlled by the Japanese army, including the Korean territory north of the 38th parallel. The growing ideological split between the United States and the USSR, the allies in the Second World War, had a major impact on the peninsula. As a result, two antagonistic states emerged, each seeing itself as a legitimate government of Korea. On December 10, 1948, the Soviet forces withdrew from North Korean territories and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea was established under the leadership of Kim er son who spent previous years with the Soviet army in the Russian parties. The Korean War of 1950-1953 between South and North Korea, a proxy war by definition, in which the Soviet Union and China supported the North and the United States supported the South, ended with signing the Armistice Agreement, creating the demilitarized zone along the 38th parallel. After the war, the Soviet Union continued to support Pyongyang by the means of economic and technical assistance, while uh, having virtually no contact uh, with the Republic of Korea backed by the United States. In 1946, the Soviet Union recruited unofficially 26,000 workers from North Korea when it was still under the direct rule of the Soviet army to work in logging and fishing enterprises in the Russian Far East. After completing the assignment, some of these workers did not want to go back to North Korea and managed to stay in Russia. The official Soviet policy on receiving North Korean workers would not begin until, until the year of 1966, after Leonid Brezhnev signed an agreement with Kim Il-sung during a close meeting held between Soviet and North Korean leaders, again, in the city of Vladivostok, that seems to be the center of those events. The practice of receiving North Korean workers survived the dissolution of the Soviet Union and continued for almost three decades since then. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union in December 1991, the attitudes of Russian Korea Saram, that's uh, how they call themselves, Korea Saram, changed steadily in the direction of greater self-awareness and autonomy. Many Korean, Korean people moved back from Central Asian republics to where they were moved by force during Stalin's rule to Primorsky and Khabarovsky provinces. According to the Russian census of um, about 150,000 people identifying themselves as ethnic Koreans, uh, 56,000 resides in the Russian uh, federal, Far Eastern Federal District. If we look at civil society indicators in the Russian Far Eastern provinces, we will notice quite a few non-governmental organizations and initiatives created by Korea Saram, including civic associations, sport organizations, and business associations. In Primorsky province, where the empirical work was conducted by my co-author Tamara Tryakova and by her students from the Far Eastern Federal University, uh, the Korean diaspora has been a notable player in the province's political, economic, and cultural life. Many Korea Saram su succeeded in businesses, while others became the elected members of provincial and municipal legislatures. Uh, most members of the Korea, the Korean diaspora today are non-religious, but they nevertheless respect ancestral family rituals and traditions having their roots in ancient Confucian rites. They celebrate, in addition to Russian holidays and traditions, the Korean national holidays. This includes spring and fall equinoxes when people visit the graveyards of their ancestors, as well as the lunar new year, Seo Lal. It's a most joyful celebration shared by all Korean people living on the peninsula and beyond. The Seolal ritual prescribes people to visit their parental homes, even if they're far away, facilitating a sustained interpersonal contact between family members. Uh, even the loss of Korean language, the Korean Mar dialect spoken by first and second generations of settlers, but almost forgotten by the following generations, does not seem to undermine the cohesiveness and resilience of the Korean diaspora, as long as the majority of its members respect core family rituals based on traditional Confucian ancestral rites and calendar. 
Um, so the chapter goes on and offers more discussion and analysis of traditional and modern civic values that have shaped the Korean identity among the members of the Korean diaspora in Russia. To conclude with, our findings demonstrate the persistence of many traditional Korean cultural identifiers that have survived the turbulent history of Korean people in Russia throughout the 20th and 21st century. Yet there is also significant differences, especially around political and civic norms and values upon which many div divisions are currently observed. For example, the conflicting interpretations uh, of major historical events, including the Korean War. Uh, the intergenerational divide is also going. Many young Koreans have been abandoning the Confucian rites and passage practice throughout the life stages and based on filial piety and traditional gender roles. The younger generations of Koreans have been also acquiring values associated with global consumer and business culture almost entirely void of ethnic sensibilities and old traditions. The global reach of South Korean economy and pop culture manifested in its flagship companies such as Samsung or Hyundai are arguably more suitable to serve as cultural identifiers for many young Koreans rather than primordial rights practiced by their parents and grandparents. To this mix, we should also add the ever-powerful South Korean movie industry. For example, the recently released Squid Game, a big hit among teenagers across the globe. Um, so the chapter was written before this show was broadcast. I'm not sure to what extent these shows are available to the young audiences in the Democratic People's Republics of Korea, but they are watched by young Korea Saram and Russia, for sure. Uh, so the linkages between South Korean and Korea Saram have contributed to improved relations between the two countries. There were a lot of interest from young Koreans to come visit Vladivostok and vice versa. And so the visa regime between the two countries was relaxed, allowing visa-free travel. The tourism was booming, especially between Primorsky province and South Korea, benefiting the local economies. It was a positive force during the pre-COVID times uh, for the track to diplomacy. Uh, so we should hope that one day the intensity of this cultural and economic exchanges will return. Thank you. Thank you, Yelena. It's really a fascinating topic and it's, it's very striking when one visits Vladivostok to see Korean culture um, yeah, present there and you see it most obviously at the, in the markets where the Korean foods are, are still sold. And now you see a lot of young Korean tourists, South Korean tourists visiting, as well as the continued presence of North Korean workers. So it, it's, it's a very fascinating topic. So uh, we still have uh, several more speakers, but I just want to tell our audience uh, that you can uh, write questions in the Q&A, and we will take questions after uh, we are all done. Um, so next, uh, we have uh, a presentation of on behalf of Professor Liu Ying. She is Associate Professor at the Institute of International Relations, China Foreign Affairs University in Beijing. She joined us for a couple of minutes, but uh, was having connection problems. Um, and if you've been following events today, you know that Beijing News inadvertently released instructions about uh, censorship of any negative news about Russia today. And so it's a very sensitive topic for uh, Chinese scholars. And since Professor Liu Ying works for the foreign ministry, she's not able to comment today. So I'm going to do my best to, to um, give us a short synopsis of her, of her talk, unless he or she is again. Um, she, is, she is here in spirit. I don't know that she wants to talk, though. Um, so she wrote a very interesting chapter uh, applying constructivism to uh, the Sino-Russian partnership. And uh, she mentions that typically we, we study Sino-Russian relations using a realist framework, um, but that uh, beginning with Alexander Wentz's work on constructivism, scholars have become more interested in the ideational foundations of international order. And uh, she is one of the few scholars in China to use this framework to understand uh, Sino-Russian relations. So she's looking at identity issues and their impact on 
uh, China Russia relations. Um, and she also relates the Western literature on constructivism to efforts in China, uh, especially Qin Ya Qing's work uh, on Chinese national identity and um, uh, Andrei Tsigankov's work on Russian identity. Andrei Tsigankov is a Russian scholar who, who uh, is based in San Francisco. Um, and so uh, in the chapter, uh, uh, Professor Leo looks at uh, the, the different identity, foreign policy identities that Russia and China hold and, uh, and uses these differences to assert that uh, this, these, these um, differing foreign policy identities will prevent the two countries from forming an alliance um, due to their different diplomatic approaches. She says that they share certain ideologies of state, certain common political trajectories, and this has brought the two countries closer together since she dates it from 2012, um, uh, but that each country has a different foreign policy identity. Uh, she, looking at, at Tsigankov's work, she, she talks about, uh, she looks about the role, she looks at the role of honor in Russia's foreign policy and how Russia is concerned with, uh, with status in relation to other countries. And she contrasts that with her conception of, of um, Chinese foreign policy which is based on a harm, what she calls a harmonious diplomacy uh, to engage with neighbors despite uh, disputes. Um, and so um, what is an interesting effort uh, by, uh, by this Chinese scholar to, to try to draw some, uh, draw some lessons from the way that each country sees itself and what that would mean for their relations uh, with each other. So, um, I mean, these are her characterizations. I think the way a country sees itself may not be the way others see that country. Um, and so she is, she is positing um, her uh, analysis based on the writings of other Chinese experts who defined Chinese foreign policy in this particular way. Uh, so I do hope you will go on and read this chapter. It's a very interesting um, uh, analysis using blending uh, Western constructivist theories and uh, some of the new discussions of Chinese international relations theories. Okay, uh, so uh, next uh, we're going to move on to Professor Archom Lukin. Uh, who is Deputy Director for Research and Associate Professor mm -hmm. at the School of Regional and International Studies at Far East Federal University in Vladivostok, Russia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Vishnik, and uh, thank you for uh, organizing uh, this webinar uh, and uh, I would like uh, to express my special uh, thanks and gratitude to Gaia Christofferson because she was uh, the mastermind of this uh, book project, uh, the main inspiration <laughs> behind this. Uh, and uh, uh, my uh, chapter uh, deals with uh, uh, deals with Russia US uh, relations. Uh, both at uh, the systemic uh, global level and uh, at the level of, of the region, uh, the Asia Pacific or the Indopac or the Indo-Pacific, if you will. By the way, uh, the title uh, of of the book uh, has this uh, Indo-Pacific moniker, uh, but it's. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting that Russia officially uh, does not use this term in the Pacific. Uh, uh, more than that, uh, uh, Russia officially uh, rejects it and even denounces uh, uh, the in the Pacific as uh, uh, as something uh, being. Uh, 
uh, promoted uh, by uh, by the U.S. and U.S. allies for some, you know, uh, for some uh, malicious uh, aims. Uh, uh, but uh, again, uh, even though uh, uh, Russia officially does not uh, accept uh, uh, in the Pacific uh, the in the Pacific discourse. Uh, many Russian experts and journalists, uh, uh, they have uh, really uh, uh, adopted uh, this term and use it widely. So, <laughs> uh, uh, so my, uh, my guess is that uh, in, uh, in future, Russia uh, might uh, accept this term officially uh, and uh, it's uh, it, it may be a replay uh, of the story with the Asia Pacific because uh, if you if you remember when uh, the Asia Pacific concept was coined uh, back in the late 60s and 70s, the Soviet Union back then was very suspicious of uh, the Asia Pacific idea or the idea of Asia Pacific regionalism. But now Russia is uh, a very big enthusiast of uh, Asia Pacific institutions and uh, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, for example, APEC, is one of Putin's favorite multilateral institutions, by the way. Uh, so, uh, and with that, I would like to uh, transit to, to, to my chapter, uh, which uh, deals exactly with Russia's uh, vision uh, of uh, international order uh, and uh, somewhat uh, counterintuitively, uh, I, I argue in my chapter that uh, Russia's uh, conception of, uh, of international order is very much, uh, is very much uh, aligned with uh, the English school of international relations theory. Uh, well, uh, it may raise some legitimate questions. Uh, after all, the English school is uh, associated with moderation uh, in international politics. Uh, and uh, the foreign policy of Putin's Russia does not exactly have a reputation for moderation especially you know considering the latest developments uh, around ukraine uh however uh, uh i do believe that the english school uh, shares many themes with moscow's contemporary foreign policy and uh, one explanation for this uh overlap lies in the genesis of the english school uh its core concept of international society uh, is to significant extent a reflection of the 19th century European order based on the concert of Europe arrangement of which Russia was one of the five members along with uh, Britain, France, Austria, and Prussia, uh, later Germany. And it should also be kept in mind that the English school uh, formed during the Cold War when the US and the Soviet Union war were the were two superpowers reigning over world politics. Uh, just to remind you that uh, the English school's most important book, The Anarchical Society by Hadley Bull was published in 1977 <clears throat> at the time of mature bipolarity. Uh, and uh, albeit uh, far from celebrating the Soviet US bipolarity, Hadley Bull did acknowledge the rationality and to some extent the legitimacy of an international order <clears throat> whereby Moscow and Washington called the shots in global affairs. Uh, so uh, with Russia under Vladimir Putin striving to regain full great power status, it shouldn't perhaps be surprising that compelling parallels can be found between the Kremlin's foreign policy uh, foreign policy doctrine and uh, a Western IR theory, uh, I mean the English school, that puts heavy emphasis on the historical periods when Russia was indisputably among the first rank global players. So uh, I don't have uh, much time left. So uh, very briefly, 
let me uh, uh, let me uh, uh, touch upon uh, the principal similarities between the English school and Russia's contemporary foreign policy. First of all, uh, that's state centrism. Both the English school and Moscow regard the sovereign state as the primary foundation of uh, international order. Uh, as you know, uh, the Westphalian approach to sovereignty is fully embraced uh, by Moscow. Then uh, the balance of power. Uh, as you remember, probably Hadley Bull identifies, identifies uh, five institutions of international society, the balance of power, international law, diplomacy, war, and the great powers. Uh, and among them, the balance of power takes the pride of place. Uh, without the balance of power, uh, nothing, uh, nothing else is possible uh, in uh, international uh, politics. Uh, the balance of power is the main precondition for other international institutions, such as uh, international law. Uh, and of course, uh, Putin uh, uh, is, uh, Putin's foreign policy is about uh, uh, such concepts as multipolarity, polycentricity, uh, which are very much founded upon uh, th this concept of the balance of power. Another uh, common theme uh, between the English school and Russia's uh, foreign policy doctrine is this idea of concept of powers. Uh, Russia has this idea of the pivotal role of great and major powers. And uh, Hedley Bull, of course, emphasizes the managerial responsibilities that the great powers bear in international society. Uh, so Russia uh, has always been promoting uh, this idea that uh, global politics should be regulated, should be uh, you know, managed by great powers. Uh, just to remind you that back in 2020, uh, Putin uh, proposed uh, uh, a summit uh, of uh, five uh, permanent members uh, of the UN Security Council, so modern uh, great powers. And unfortunately, this uh, idea uh, has not been realized of this summit, and probably this contributed to, to, to the crisis we are witnessing right now around uh, Ukraine. And uh, it's also interesting that uh, according to Hadley Bull, according to the English school, spheres of influence are one mechanism through which great powers maintain international order. And of course, Russia wholeheartedly embraces uh, the spheres of influence uh, concept. In 2008, then President Dmitry Medvedev uh, famously stated that there are regions where Russia has uh, privileged interests, this is Medvedev's quote. Uh, and uh, or I think what uh, we currently are observe uh, around Ukraine is very much the expression uh, uh, of, this, uh, of this doctrine uh, that Russia has its own sphere of influence. Uh, uh, it has this legitimate right to, 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 to its sphere of influence, but this legitimate right has been denied. So if uh, we can't get uh, our sphere of influence recognized through diplomacy, uh, we will uh, secure it by force. So uh, this is what's happening uh, right now. Uh, and I think uh, it, it can also be explained uh, by Russia's uh, uh, vision of international order as explained by, uh, by the English school. Of course, I, uh, I'm concluding uh, uh, my presentation. Of course, I don't, uh, I don't think that Putin has ever read any works by Ted de Bull or other <laughs> English school uh, theorists. But again, it's amazing. Uh, it's amazing uh, when you analyze uh, Russian uh, foreign policy uh, documents, official documents, or if you look at speeches and remarks by Vladimir Putin, uh, Sergei Lavrov, uh, it's really amazing uh, how much 
similarity uh, similarities there are between uh, Russian uh, foreign policy discourse uh, and uh, and uh, uh, the English school, or uh, at least uh, the English school as are uh, uh, rendered by uh, uh, by the anarchical society uh, of Hadley Bull, because there are many strains of of the English school, and uh, in my chapter. Uh, I refer uh, specifically to Hadley Bull. Thank you very much. Thank you, Artyom. Um, so it's interesting to be talking about order, international order at a time when the world seems to be falling apart around us. Um, uh, but my task also is to look at how the, the English school uh, helps us inform our understanding of the interaction between Russia and China in, in the Indo-Pacific or East Asia. Um, and I also borrow from Headley Bull's concept of order. And so by order, uh, I'm talking about the most limited type of uh, society of separate sovereign states that interact in institutions and are connected by shared practices and norms and rules. So in, at this juncture, when everyone is trying to determine just how close is this partnership between China and Russia, I think um, looking at some of the, the principles that bring them together helps us to understand some of the drivers of the partnership. And we can also look at where these principles fail, fall short in terms of practical cooperation on particular issues. Um, so the English school has not typically been used to look at China-Russia um, interactions. Guy in her chapter uh, uh, does this in terms of Central Asia and uh, Danish scholar Lisa Odgard also did some work on this uh, on this issue. So I think it's 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 useful uh, to understand how China and Russia um, approach great power management in the Asian region. And uh, the, the concept of new type of great power relations that we typically associate with US-China relations actually began with the Russia-China uh, relationship and uh, outlined, uh, the, and according to the Chinese perspective, a certain approach to, um, to relations was outlined in this term involving avoidance of conflict, mutual respect, mutual cooperation, and control of disagreements. So this was the framework for uh, the partnership as, as China saw it, the kind of principles going forward for this relationship. For Russia, the emphasis has been more on having an equal partnership. And so Russia has been uh, push, putting forward a concept of multipolarity where um, that uh, Artyom was talking about this concert of powers where you would have a, a balance of equal powers. And, and so that's, that's at the root of this concept of multipolarity the Russian diplomats have been, um, have been putting forward. Um, and China has agreed with that until quite recently when, they, when uh, Xi Jinping uh, came to power and started talking about the community of common destiny. Uh, so that's a slightly different term. And if you look at the recent agreement that Russia and China signed on February 4th, you see that they don't quite agree that those are equivalent terms because the community of common destiny might have a community leader and that could be China. And so some in Russia have, have expressed uh, uh, some caution about that Chinese term, which would, which would not uh, necessarily equate with their concept of multipolarity. Um, and so I think that in, uh, in terms of great power management, though, in East Asia, uh, China and Russia agree on certain rules of the road in the region um, in terms of their joint opposition to US-led coalitions and partnerships uh, and uh, defense uh, arrangements, uh, THAAD, uh, AUKUS, um, the Quad and so forth, I mean, they share that. Uh, they um, agreed that non-nuclear states should not be involved in nuclear proliferation. Uh, they are opposed to the role of outside powers. 
Now, this is interesting because one might ask, um, is Russia an inside power? Is Russia an Asian state? And sometimes uh, Chinese officials have defined Asia for Asians, so are Russians Asians? Um, but by outsiders, generally they mean the US and its allies rather than themselves. Um, and then they have certain common approaches uh, to, uh, to various issues in terms of the use of, of uh, cyber tools and a kind of negative soft power to discredit um, opponents. And so they, I think there are certain common rules, um, but there are also certain limitations. So there's a, and, and Russia and China and their partnership distinguish between these, these larger global standards and the specific regional contexts. Uh, Russia talks about adjacent states in its foreign policy concept. And China talks about the bottom line principle in terms of its core interests on issues such as uh, Taiwan or the South China Sea and, and so on. And so we see China and Russia agreeing to disagree on many territorial issues in the region um, in terms of uh, South China Sea and, and Taiwan. And, and we've seen uh, China try to um, try not to uh, get too close to Russian positions on uh, Ukraine or Abkhazia or South Ossetia, uh, abstaining in the 2014 UN vote, um, for example, and trying to stay clear of Russian support for secessionism. So we have, we see a certain divergence in terms of the practice in, of their diplomacy in the region but an agreement on this, on some of the broad brushstrokes of how uh, of how they are going to manage um, their relationship in East Asia, and this is possible more possible I think in Asia than in in uh, Europe because we have uh, we have a more fluid order. You have you have multiple. Um, you have multiple centers of power. You have the U.S. alliance system, but you also have ASEAN, uh, and you have other regional um, initiatives. And so, Russia and China together are challenging the U.S.-led order, um, but uh, they themselves have questions about uh, how that order uh, that is not dominated by the U.S. would would be governed. Uh, would a Chinese-led order be hierarchical uh, surrounding China, um, and how how would where would Russia fit into such an order, and how how would how does Russia participate in this region where it where its economic um, and and um, political ties are not as strong as as those of many other states. So Russia is viewed as much of, as an outsider. Um, so to conclude, I'll just say that, that what the English school does is it shows that there are agreements in certain principles between Russia and China, uh, but the devil is in the details, the practice of, of their interactions, which are not always, uh, where they're not always in lockstep. And we see this in Asia, um, to a certain degree, and we're certainly seeing that in Europe uh, right now. Uh, so I'm going to stop there, and I, I would like to thank the Weatherhead East Asian Institute for hosting us, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to talk about this often neglected issue, and we hope that the audience has some questions for us, so you can uh, put your questions in the Q&A box. And then we can turn to the audience. So uh, while we're waiting for the audience members to think of some questions, um, Gaia, do you have some general uh, issues you would like to raise? Well, uh, I'd like to mention that there were other authors in the book that we couldn't include in the uh, webinar that we have here now. Uh, do you want me to mention their names and what they wrote on? 
through a few other oh, questions. Sure, that would be great. So um, Alexandra Korolev and Vladimir Portyakov wrote on uh, Sino-Russian relations, a uh, neoclassical realist explanation. And Lowell Dimmer uh, wrote on the, uh, the triangle, uh, Russia, China, and the American dilemma. So that was all in the same section with RTM Lukin on uh, triangular relations. Um, and then uh, uh, Tamara and Elena and Ying Liu and uh, myself, no, that was foreign policy identities. And then regional relations uh, was Liz, Taneo, myself, and Amanda Juan uh, from Vietnam, but working in Singapore, and Pushpa Tambi Pillai from Malaysia, but she was working in Singapore also, uh, writing on Russia and Southeast Asia, which there are not very many scholars that do that. So we were lucky to be able to uh, grab them for that. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to mention that there were other authors with chapters in the book. And I also wanted to throw out an idea. Why don't we think about doing another book, but let's not wait 10 years. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I have 10 years, but uh, let, why don't we think about doing another book? Um, we can still organize it around Russia's relations um, in the Asia Pacific, but I'm open to a lot of different ideas. I just want to throw it out there because I know it takes a long time before anybody sort of gets to that point. Okay, so we have a, thank you, Gaia. We have a question from the audience. If Russia and China disagree with the US led world order, what do they propose instead? Oh, do you want to answer that? Um, would any, who would like to start? Artyom, do you want to? Jump in. Uh, yeah. Uh, th thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think I can agree uh, with uh, with the premise uh, of this question uh, that uh, uh, that uh, Russia and China are are, uh, are not uh, uh, offering uh, any alternatives to. To the U.S. Uh, so-called liberal hegemony, uh, I don't think uh, that's uh, that's uh, uh, that's what's happening. Uh, uh, I think, uh, and uh, actually, I have tried to show in my chapter that Russia does have a more or less coherent uh, uh, view of uh, of a desirable world order. And this uh, view is uh, is similar to to the English school. So that's basically my main argument. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, as far as I understand from uh, Elizabeth Vishnik's uh, remarks, uh, uh, China also has its own uh, idea of uh, how our international order should look like and this is the idea of a uh, community of common destiny and by the way Elise I uh, find your uh, remark uh, 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 very insightful your remark about uh, 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 about Russia feeling uh, 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 a bit uncomfortable with this idea of, uh, of the community of common destiny because uh, I think you are absolutely right that any community uh, uh, is likely to have, you know, the leader, <laughs> and it's absolutely obvious who is, uh, who should be the leader in this uh, community of common destiny, right? It, and it's it's not going to be Russia, <laughs> right? So uh, uh, I I really find uh, uh, this ob observation from from you very very interesting and uh, very insightful. Something to, uh, at least for me, to think uh, to think about. Thank you very much. Well, it's because it, this language has started coming up in the time of the renewal of the friendship was signed in June of 2021. You see, see this phrasing where Russia supports a multipolar order and recognizes that China supports a community of. Country. 
So to me, that says that they don't both agree on the nature of the order necess the end point of this of this order. Um, so I, th I think that uh, they to answer this question, I think they each have their own I Oh, I'm sorry, my internet seems to be not stable. Uh, they each have their own conception of order. Um, and I think they they have oh, they share certain principles of order, but they don't necessarily agree to the specifics of how to implement it or to the end point of the order anymore. So this is a kind of a parallelism, but not an identity of views. And I and and maybe we should raise the issue of of identity here. Um, that it comes up in Ing Leo's paper. So do other panelists agree that identity is a barrier to the creation of such an order by Russia and China? Yelena, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I mean, my take on their English school, what I remember is that the importance of shared norms and values, and that was defined, what defines international society as opposed to international system, because the Hedley Bowl distinguished, you know, the international system, international society, and then hands with the world system, right? So there is certain evolution of the international order from the system to the society to the world system. And this evolution can be tracked through the presence or absence of shared norms and values and understandings. And I think this is exactly what is missing now in, in the, I don't know, if the, if the in the vision, uh, you know, offered by you know Russia or China, because they they say actually the opposite. We don't really need to share those norms and values. We just leave it to ourselves to define our own values, and our people should define what dem democracy is, right? Nobody else can define this. So that's kind of trying to get away from shared norms and, and understandings. Say basically saying it is not relevant. So for me, you know. It's not a strong premise for the beginning of discussion of, of, of a new shared you know, international society envisioned by Russia or China. I mean, it's not, it's not a society because of the absence of this exactly shared identity and shared norms and values. So I, I'm not sure if uh, <laughs> there will be some, maybe uh, Artyom will not agree with me because his reading of the Hadley Bowl is, Bowl is, is, is somewhat different, I guess. Gaia, do you, do you have a... a well, um, I always thought that the Chinese conception of order was based on the Belt and Road Initiative, which is an economic initiative, but it seemed to be taking on more of a political role as well, and um, possibly even a security role um, that, um, that Beijing was more and more asking the Belt and Road uh, countries to coordinate their policies with Beijing, meaning adapt your policies to Beijing policy. And it was uh, just slowly, slowly becoming more uh, security oriented, maybe uh, using uh, China, using private security firms to protect projects on the Belt and Road, for example, in Pakistan, and maybe using uh, the military to protect projects in the Middle East or Afghanistan. But um, in Central Asia, you know, there's been this formula of China has an economic uh, responsibility in Central Asia, an economic role, and Russia has the security role. But I don't think the Chinese, they agreed to it, they accepted it, but they don't think, uh, they didn't think that Russia's security role was very important, right? The economic uh, role was much more important in Central Asia up until the Kazakhstan crisis. And that was a really, from my point of view, looking at it from a distance, really, uh, uh, it was a shock to the Chinese to the extent that the CSTO went into uh, Kazakhstan and the Chinese felt marginalized. It's my impression, they felt marginalized. And they did offer to contribute to security in Kazakhstan, but I don't think the Kazakhstan President Kukayev took them up on that. 
And I think that was a big shock to the Chinese. Um, so this formula of China has an economic role and Russia has a security role possibly is not that stable. And I was looking back at something I wrote about 25 years ago where Moscow was trying to encourage China to join the CSTO. I haven't found the actual citation yet, but I know it's there somewhere. Um, and something I read recently, it sounds like Russians are encouraging China to join the CSTO, but I don't think China would because Russia would be the leader. And it, why would China join a security organization that China is, the, uh, Russia is the leader and China would be just one of the countries in that. Um, but this addresses the question of, are they becoming more closely aligned in security issues? But this is all around the Kazakhstan crisis. I don't know if you've been following it. Yes. and. I'm surprised that they that Moscow would have asked China to join the CSTO ever. Um, they they yeah. actually tried to back them. They, I think they tried to back them into it by linking up, uh, linking the SCO with uh, the CSTO. It was sort of a back door, doorway into getting China involved in that. But, I haven't found the citation yet, so maybe I should mention it. But, uh -huh. but uh, recently, uh, uh, a Russian analyst uh, suggested that, that China might want to join the CSTO. And then they wouldn't be marginalized in Kazakhstan. That was the point. Well, they might want to. I don't know if Russia would like that very much. Um, well, Russia would be the leader, not China. Hmm. Uh, I want to hear Artyom's view, but I, I just want to make uh, one point there. Recently, Pre President uh, Xi Jinping met with Kazakhstan's President Tokayev and kept emphasizing the importance of sovereignty. So I think uh, China was a little bit um, startled by the entry of the CSTO force that was predominantly Russian troops and was concerned about that precedent and what that would mean for Kazakhstan, which is, uh, which is a country where China has um, substantial investments in, compared to Ukraine, for example. I think there oh. was some 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 concern there but i want to hear our tom's view on that do you think that that russia would be amenable to china joining the the collective security treaty organization to have a joint management of security in central asia oh uh, yeah uh, 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 frankly i'm a bit surprised uh, by what uh, uh, gaia just uh, revealed uh, and I, I would like to uh, ask uh, Gaia for uh, for a source uh, because uh, uh, to me it, it's uh, uh, completely new, you know, information that uh, Russia has ever uh, has ever uh, offered uh, has asked China to join the Collective Security Treaty Organization, the CSTO. Well, uh, frankly, I doubt. I doubt that Russia has ever asked China to join the CSTO for uh, for a very uh, you know obvious reason. Uh, if China joins uh, uh, the CSTO, Russia uh, would no longer be uh, the indisputable leader. Uh, and dominant power within this bloc. And Russia, of course, sees the CSTO as its own, you know, uh, organization, you know. So uh, it's, uh, I think it's similar to how the US uh, responded uh, to Putin's uh, suggestion uh, of Russia entering NATO back in 2000. By the way, I think just yesterday, just yesterday when uh, making his uh, address to the nation on Ukraine. Uh, if you if you uh, watched or read uh, Putin's mm -hmm. address uh, on Ukraine, he mentioned that back in 2000, uh, when he was uh, meeting with uh, President Bill Clinton, uh, he Putin asked Clinton uh, about America's possible you know response if Russia wanted to uh, 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 enter. 
to be if Russia wanted to become a member of NATO. And according to Putin, Clinton was not enthusiastic at all about it. So I think uh, for the same reason, uh, Russia uh, wouldn't like to, to see China as a member of the CSTO. And uh, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is a different matter. Uh, it, it's, not a, uh, it's not a military multilateral alliance. So uh, uh, actually, uh, again, I have my doubts. Uh, and speaking of uh, Kazakhstan, well, uh, uh, Oh, I would say this, no one knows what the Chinese top leadership thinks about Kazakhstan or about Ukraine. So we can, we can have our guesses, we can speculate, but no one really knows what Xi Jinping and uh, the Politburo Standing Committee members really think about Ukraine or Kazakhstan, and even top ranking Chinese experts don't know. So when someone uh, refer us to some senior Chinese expert saying something about Ukraine and Kazakhstan. I actually kind of uh, I don't believe it, so it's uh, it's not serious. Let me uh, ask. You don't. So it's, think bla it's black box basically. Uh, and uh, uh, just uh, let me conclude. Uh, okay. uh, I think that uh, China uh, China uh, was not unhappy. Let me put it this way: was not unhappy with Russia's intervention in Kazakhstan, because uh, uh, Russia was the only force capable of stabilizing Kazakhstan. If Russia had not intervened in Kazakhstan, there was a real risk that Kazakhstan would implode, first implode and then explode. Uh, so China, uh, I think, should be actually thankful to Russia for uh, intervening and stabilizing Kazakhstan because Kazakhstan was on the brink, was on the brink. Thank you very much. Well, no, I, I think I'd agree with you. I think many Russians said that to the Chinese that you should thank us because we protected your economic interests. And so you shouldn't be a little uneasy about the fact that we did that. But I think you can find evidence that the Chinese were uh, speechless or uneasy, uh, that that happened and it happened so quickly. It made them realize that they don't have the same knowledge and cultural relations with Kazakhstan that Russia has. They don't have anywhere near that. It made them realize that. And that was pointed out to them by many Russian analysts anyway, that Russia has a special relationship with Kazakhstan. And the security relationship is very important. And the economic relationship does not trump the security relationship, which I think maybe China had uh, undervalued. Anyway, I, I'm trying to look at it right now. I haven't really come to the final conclusion of what I'm looking at. Yes, all these moving targets that we have to assess. It's a moving target, right. It, it, it is true, it's hard to determine what, what uh, the leadership of Russia or China thinks on on many topics and we are all exceedingly puzzled by many events. Uh, Actually, so Elizabeth, uh, yes. uh, just one intervention. Uh, it's uh, very transparent what, what the Russian leadership thinks. Uh, it's, it's very transparent about things. Uh, just uh, look at Putin. Uh, he's very frank, very direct, but the Chinese leadership is a totally different, you know, in, in this respect. It's very non-transparent, it's black box. So. Putin, just like the American leaders, is very direct about, about what Russia wants. But China is different. It's black box. I thank you. I don't know. I differ with you on that one. If you see the, there was an exchange just recently about what Russia wanted in eastern Ukraine. What were the limits of Russian ambitions? And there was no clear answer from Russian officials. Um, but anyway, let us get to our um, question from the audience about whether or not Russia and China are seeking a change of order uh, to better fit their values um, as opposed to the current system. Should we be looking at, at the role of values as in terms of bringing Russia and China together in the East Asian region? Do they share values that would enable them to create uh, a new order? 
Yelena, do you, do you have some thoughts? Well, I mean, we can try to bring back our theoretical literature and what, def what the definition of values. So if you look at the political values, um, if you go look at cultural values, you know, there's uh, norms around the what type of political regime, uh, you know, things like that. So I think there are certain values already shared by Russia and China. We see it in the common statements. And the value of not having common value is, is a value itself, right? The value saying that we should not share values about what types of political regime we have is, is in itself is a, is a statement of a value, right? So there is some shared values, but not much. I wouldn't go too far, um, you know, um, in terms of there is a value of non-interference and internal affairs. But it's not the set of values what usually is presented as liberal set of values, right? What we talk about values, a normative understanding, we usually talk about certain types of values associated with the liberal world order. So I think we have to be clear on the definition of what we mean by values um, and culture, right? And there is a, a desire to have a very sh limited definition of values to keep it short, or maybe we expand it to also include certain cultural understanding, historical understandings, you know, practices and so forth. So religion, so is it Huntington types of values? So like, what do we mean by values? So I think let's just define that first before we go any further. Mm. Yeah, and so that, that makes me think of, of the concept of Asia Pacific Russia that has become popular in the, in the Russian Far East in, in trying to situate uh, Russia more, um, more properly in the region and, and push back at at um, notions that Russia is somehow an outside power. So what about from the point of view of, of, um, of looking from the bottom up in terms of the way people interact? Um, on, all of us have studied the borderlands of China and Russia in various ways. Yelena, you've looked at the environmental aspects very closely. And Gaia, you've looked at the economic aspects. And Artem, you've looked at regional politics. And, and I also have, have done a lot of these studies. So, so do we see some kind of bottom-up um, uh, push for, uh, for some kind of uh, regional China-Russia order? Or, or should we be looking more at these uh, bigger norms and principles as, as a foundation of, of their uh, great power interactions in in the region. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, uh, do you mean uh, a perspective from uh, from the Russian Far East, from from the people in the Russian Far East? Yes, yeah, like Viktor Larin, uh, he, our our old okay. friend from uh, Institute uh -huh. of History, it talks often about Asia Pacific Russia. Okay, I see. Uh, let me <laughs> let me respond. Uh, frankly, uh, I don't think uh, people here in the Russian Far East they really care about such grand concepts as Asia Pacific Russia. So I think uh, apart from Viktor Larin, uh, there are very few people <laughs> who I know who really care about such things. So uh, people here, uh, uh, as most people. Uh, in the world, they care about their livelihoods, right? Uh, they don't care about Asia Pacific Russia, Indo Pacific Russia, you know, Eurasian Russia, whatever. Uh, uh, they, but they do care about uh, their wallet, right? Uh, they do care about whether they have uh, uh, an opportunity to travel to Korea, to Japan, you know. To Thailand for shopping, for leisure, for uh, you know some medical services, and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, something which was available uh, before the pandemic, but now it's gone. So that's a big concern here because uh, uh, the borders of China, Korea, and Japan remain closed, you know, for two years. Uh, and actually, it's uh, a very heavy blow to uh, to Vladivostok's economy. Uh, I think someone uh, already mentioned it uh, before the pandemic. Vladivostok was receiving, you know, crowds and crowds of 
tourists from Korea, Japan, China. I think uh, Elizabeth traveled to Vladivostok uh, uh, just before the pandemic, and uh, you could see it yourself. Uh, now we ha we have lost it. So this is what really worries people here, no, not Asia Pacific, Russia, or some <laughs> stuff like that. Thank you. But on this, just building on that, what just Artem was saying, I know that many tourists from China or Korea actually came to see Vladivostok as some sort of a European city in the Pacific East, you know? So they view, they view Russia as, in many instances, a, as a European, culture, you know, so in, in, we talk about cultural terms, you know, uh, Russia belongs or belongs in Europe, you know, rather than Asia Pacific, you know, so if we don't take the political culture, but just something else, you know, uh, a culture broadly understood, like literature or maybe religion, I, I don't know, some, the ways of lives, you know, it is closer in Europe than in, in Asia, clearly. And so, uh, so I would say what the question, the larger question is that in the long term, whether it's going to play a role in Russia going back, closer back with the West rather than becoming closer and closer aligned with, with China. That's, I think, a, a, a bigger question that we should ask. And some scholars would say, well, in the long term, it is essentially, you know, it's a European culture and it's so inevitable eventually they will get to accept those uh, values, political values, including, but it will take several generations to learn them. So they view Russia as some sort of being a little bit behind in the in the kind of a timeline of development, uh, its society and political culture, but inevitably will eventually embrace those set of values now com commonly shared by Europe. So I think that is a question that I think is interesting to investigate and answer. So I kind of align to those views personally, so, but uh, I don't know if Artem agrees or not. <laughs> so there was a question from the audience: if if the if the two countries are are building a new order independently or collectively, um, in term you know relying on their individual values or on sh and shared values, I would say, I personally I would say independently, and that, and that's why you see, uh, that's why you see some overlapping values but not, uh, not identical views on every issue, because they agree to disagree on many points in, in, in East Asia, I would say. Um, uh, yeah. could, could I jump in? Actually, sure, I, sure. I, I have a very short answer uh, to this question. Uh, I think uh, 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 China and Russia, uh, they seek to, uh, displays the U.S. Uh, as the hegemon collectively. So their collective aim is to do away with American hegemony. This is something that they are determined to do together collectively. But uh, after uh, the U.S. is no longer the dominant power, uh, I'm afraid uh, Russia's and China's ways uh, could part. And so that's a big question. Uh, whether Russia and China uh, uh, would be able and willing to work together uh, after the end of American hegemony. Uh, so, uh, so that's kind of <laughs> complicated. I, I think I would agree with Artiel that what holds them together is um, resisting. I don't know if I'd use the word hegemony though. America doesn't feel very hegemonic these days. <laughs> But, um, but that's what holds them together at the very top. Uh, in terms of shared values at the local level, uh, I don't know about society to society relations. You know, there's been a lot of effort, different campaigns uh, to have societal relations improve or cultural relations, uh, the year of Russian language in China, the year of Chinese language in Russia the year of local level relations, I can't remember the name of it, the year of societal relations. There's campaign after campaign to try to build up some kind of shared understanding at the local level. But I, I do believe there's lots of people who are making money, um, Chinese making money off Russians and Russians making money off Chinese at the local level. As RTO mentioned, there's a lot of tourism and don't forget all that uh, gas and oil 
coming from Russia into China. There's there's going to be uh, different organizations or people that benefit from the Sino-Russian relationship, but it's really held together at the very top and below the very top. I think there's uh, a lot of criticism, a lot of resistance, all in all. I think uh, this uh, these new gas and oil agreements that they've come up with makes Russia more dependent on the Chinese market. And I think that's a source of eventually tension if, if um, because maybe China will take advantage of that. The more dependent Russia becomes on China. I think we can see um, the Chinese will drive hard bargains. Uh, historically, they always have. Uh, when the oil market is down, and Russia is short on revenue, that's when the Chinese really have a hard bargaining. And I think the more Russia depends on China, uh, the more tension they, that's my thought, just related to energy anyway. Well, I think it's premature to see the end of the US role in Asia. And many countries are, are, are uh, regrouping with the US because of concerns about China. And, and Russia also has some interest in, in furthering its own goals in Asia that um, require it to have some distance from China in terms of its partnership with Vietnam or with India and, and so on. So I, I think that they do have that the I would agree that they share the goal of opposing uh, US domination, but I think they have different paths in, in achieving that. And, there's a Chinese diplomat, Fu Ying, who uh, wrote about this, how Russia and China have very different approaches to problems. I'm sure Ying Liu is very aware of this writing. Um, so it, it's a fascinating relationship to follow. And the story of China and Russia and Asia you know, starts um, centuries ago, as Elena has mentioned to us, we need to keep in mind historical movements of people and what and and how and their patterns of interactions over centuries not just in the in the last few days and um as so so we here will continue to follow this this evolving story of russia and china and other great powers in asia and we thank the audience for staying with us on a tuesday evening when so many uh, other events are bursting out all over the world. And um, thank you again to the Weatherhead East Asian Institute uh, for hosting us. And thank you, Liz, for, for helping organize this. Thank you very much. Uh, thank and you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yes, thank you, everyone. Great to see everyone.